Bitcoin. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, 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 the, the uh, joint meeting of the Hong Kong Study Circle and Hong Kong Philatelic Society. And um, uh, it's nice to see um, uh, so many of you coming. And, uh, and tonight is it's, uh, it's very special that we have a, an honored guest, uh, a well-known uh, Hong Kong collector from Canada, Ingo Nessel, and um, and he'll be actually it, it's it's a one man show, uh, and he'll be talking about the Hong Kong eight cent uh, King George VI definitive stamp, a uh, very interesting stamp, and um, I'm sure that uh, you know he'll give a very not lively talk and uh, and and a discussion. We can discuss the uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, you know, if anything you, you you want to ask him. So without further ado, I think um, I'll, I'll pass it to uh, Ingo and uh, I'll stop share my screen. All right, okay. let me do my screen share. All right, can everybody see that? Yes, yes. So you called it a one-man show. This is a one-stamp show. <laughs> yeah. So this is the story of a single stamp. Um, during my evolution from stamp collector to philatelist and eventually to specialist, I thought it would be a fun challenge to pick one stamp and study it to see how far the story can go. My first question was how to choose that stamp. Well, it had to be a stamp for my chosen specialty of Hong Kong, and preferably King George VI era. I favor this era in British Empire philately for the many pictorial uh, designs, which are so beautiful. Um, I'm giving some examples here from Dominica, Gilbert and Ellis Islands, and Falkland Islands, which has some of the most beautiful George's Six uh, stamps. Um, so that's one of my reasons for picking that era. Um, also, I was born in 1950 when George the Sixth was still in reigning, and so I consider George the Sixth to be my king. Uh, the king is the head of state of Canada. But uh, Hong Kong also had some beautiful commemorative issues in the Georgia Sixth Era. Um, this issue celebrating the 100th anniversary of British occupation. Um, while beautiful, it doesn't really offer a lot of variety. Um, uh, I love these stamps, don't get me wrong, but it's not that interesting to study this set. So I decided, let me go to a definitive. and. Um, that was a question then, which one? So I looked at the um, King George VI definitive issue in all its uh, variations of color and different printings. And I just, I don't even know how it happened. I, I saw the eight cent stamp and I liked the color, that brown color. And I thought, let me just see what that is. And I realized very quickly by looking in the catalog, that was issued in November 1st, 1941 three years after the original set was released in April 38. So it turns out there was a rate change. The rate for a first class letter to China and Macau was five cents per ounce or part thereof since 1932. And on September 12, 1941, that rate was raised to eight cents. So they needed, needed an eight cent stamp. There were still stocks of the King George V eight cent stamps available throughout 1941, uh, but there was pressure uh, to get a new monarch, the, the new King George VI uh, stamp eight cents going, uh, and, and resources were scarce owing to World War II, uh, which was then raging in Europe. So our story begins on that first day of November 1941, when the new eight cent 
stamp was released to the public. Um, I'll start off with a, a, a description of the design of the stamp. It's got a distinctively clean design with unembellished graphic features. It was printed by typography. Uh, it's based on the Queen Victoria definitives, and there's a, a, a look at how similar the design is. Uh, the design was created by a Frenchman who moved to England and became a significant stamp designer uh, for 1860s and 1870s issues, uh, a guy named Jean Ferdinand Joubert. The portrait is surrounded by a thin double frame lines containing the country name and value in Chinese and English. Um, anybody who's seen Vince King's Tambromani exhibit, uh, they he said that this is the first royal portrait surrounded by rectangular frames. Um, there are no numerals. The value is written out in alpha and in Chinese characters. Um, this was a little bit controversial as literacy was not a given in those days and previous definitives of King George the Fifth and Edward all showed num numeral values. Another anomaly is that the monarch faces right. Uh, I don't know why the orientation of the monarch's head is so important, but I'll, I know that a lot of ink was spilled writing about the monarch is facing right versus uh, usual facing left. And uh, there's, a, there's an example of the issue that followed this, the Queen Elizabeth uh, Wilding issue, which has the queen facing uh, left. So, um, like I say, I don't, I don't get the importance of that, but there are a lot of writings about which way the monarch is facing. Um, Hong Kong is spelled as one word. Uh, this is something that changed back and forth over the years, and the two words for Hong Kong were only permanently used on their stamps from uh, the 1962 Second Queen Elizabeth issue with the Anagoni portrait. So Hong Kong has two words. Uh, like I say, it, it hasn't, it hadn't been used in uh, the 1940s uh, King George VI era. Uh, there's some iconic, I ironic iconography on this stamp. So the upper corners have the St. Edward's crown, which is the imperial state crown, makes sense. Uh, but the lower co corners have a stylized ornament, which is a swastika, which is based on a philfot or gamadian, which are medieval Anglo-Saxon symbols. In fact, many ancient cultures, including Asi Asian cultures, produced variations of this design, which invariably had positive meanings, including good luck, the infinite, infinity of creation, and the unconquered revolving sun. So this presents us with multiple layers of irony, because first there is the fact that the British royal family was of German descent, Secondly, Germany became Britain's existential enemy in World War II, using the swastika as their national symbol. And here's an example of the many variations of the swastika symbol over the years from the different cultures. Uh, and then, of course, this symbol made the swastika forever become a symbol of revulsion, uh, took away the reverence of that, that beautiful symbol. So it's an unfortunate thing, and it's an ironic thing that a British colony carried the uh, swastika. Um, the stamps were printed by typography, as I said, in sheets of 120, uh, 12 rows of 10, uh, or sometimes it was divided into two panes of 60. Um, only a very few pre-production items for the King George's sixth issue have surfaced in the philatelic market, and none that I can tell of the eight cent stamp. The entire King George the sixth set was perforated with a semicircle specimen for distribution to UPU members. I'm going to get to that in a minute. I just wanted to talk about this slide. Um, so there's uh, three requisitions for this stamp. 
there was requisition B, D, and E. And um, the original printers were De La Rue. Uh, but because of World War II, some of the printing was subcontracted to either Bradbury Wilkinson, Harrison and Sons, and Williams Lee and Company. We do have a, a record of two of the requisitions uh, quantities. And unfortunately, there's no record of how many of the D uh, uh, requisition were ordered. So I did a rough calculation basing that D would have been at least 30,000 sheets and you come up to 20 million stamps. So this is not a rarity. There's a lot of these stamps around. Here's the pain layout. Um, thank you to Nick Halewood for, uh, in his book, uh, The Study of Hong Kong Adhesives of King George VI. He shows the layout of the issue in general, and this does apply to the eight cent also. Uh, you've got your plate number plug. You've got uh, the sheet gutter. There's the crown CA um, watermark. And uh, you see the two two uh, sheets of 60 to make up the full pane. And here's the real thing. Again, courtesy of Nick Halewood. I have a couple of these uh, myself, but I had a hard time scanning them. And Nick sent me this image, so I decided to use this for the talk. Um, there's the specimen overprint. Um, so they figure that approximately 300 of them were used. And they, they did the overprint in a semicircle to avoid uh, damaging the king's uh, image. They got it in backwards. According to uh, James Benden UPU specimen stamps, um, while the stamp was printed by Harrison and Sons, the specimen perforation was applied by Del Blue. That was an interesting little fact that I didn't uh, realize till I looked up the Benden book. Um, colors and shades. So there's a, the, the original printing color is a rich, deep red brown. Um, subsequent printings produced lighter shades of red brown, a chestnut version, and a distinctive deep brown red. Um, description of the colors comes from the many catalogs who all use slightly different terminologies. Um, the terminology of colors in, in philately is a whole subject you can do a, a big talk on because people call the same color different things. My sources uh, are Gibbons catalog, Scott catalog, and Yang specialized catalog, as well as the Murray Payne Commonwealth King George VI catalog. Um, I'm showing variations of the, like progressions of the shades through different printings, uh, including this chestnut shade, which shows that it's from uh, requisition B, and this uh, red brown shade, which is very distinctive, very reddish. Um, but this talk is not a deep dive into color. That's beyond the scope of this. It, I, it's just too much. One of the problems with color in stamps is that it also depends on the light source, whether you're looking at it in sunlight or uh, uh, artificial light, and also your own eyes. Everybody's eyes are different and perceive color differently. So, so I find the issue of uh, color and shades in philately is a very treacherous one to make any definitive statements on. As with any printing process, this stamp has numerous flaws. And a few are listed in catalogs and specialist literature. Um, so this is the most uh, famous one. It is listed in Gibbons and Yang and the Commonwealth catalog, but not in Scott. It's the stop after sense, at the, the S of sense, very distinctive, very easy to spot. And I was really lucky to get a positional mint block with that. Um, a few more are a few more flaws for this stamp are recorded in Halewood and Aunt Cheryl's book, but many more have been discovered by members of the Hong Kong Study Circle, but they remain undocumented. Um, suffice to say, if you examine large quantities of these typographic stamps, you can find almost an infinite number of varieties. 
Um, but like color variation, plate varieties are beyond the beyond the examples shown here are outside the scope of this talk. I'm just going to show you. Here's the dot between the frame and the uh, uh, portrait, a broken swastika, a broken frame line. And this one, I'm going to draw your attention to a little bit more. It's sort of as if the thing was broken and they tried to fix it with that extra blob of color um, to strengthen it. And um, I discovered that one, and I discussed it with Nick uh, Halewood, and we went back and forth. He found an example, and uh, I'll just ask you to keep that in mind for a later slide uh, when we get to another section of this talk. Uh, but like I say, there's I, I have about 30 different plate flaws that Nick and I have exchanged, and we're not going to go into uh, a fly spec examination here. So we'll talk a little bit about usages in a minute, uh, just back to the story of the stamp. So while the, the World War II had not come to all of Asia yet, Japan was engaged in occupying mainland China since the 1930s. And by 1941, felt they were ready to attack the European-held possessions, including Malaya, Indochina, and Hong Kong. In the colony, preparations were bravely made for the impending attack with fundraising activities made into postal slogans. There you got one of those postal slogans by bombers. Um, and um, unfortunately, the British authorities secretly determined that Hong Kong was indefensible and, and did not commit any significant military support over and above that which was currently stationed in the colony. A contingent of Canadian, um, approximately 1,900 soldiers called the Sea Force, was sent to Hong Kong to bolster their defense. So from November 1st onwards, this stamp was used singly for letters to China and Macau, as well as combination with other stamps for letters to empire and foreign destinations. Um, then on December 7th, Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese. Uh, this, this led to an immediate declaration of war by the USA and allies on Japan. Uh, but the Japanese were not finished with surprise attacks. The day after Pearl Harbor, they attacked Hong Kong. They first disabled Tai Kai Tak Airport by bombing it and the aircraft station there. And in the ensuing weeks, they overran the colony, slaughtering or imprisoning Allied soldiers, placing Allied civilians into internment camp. Uh, the post office ceased operations by approximately December 12th. Uh, for the next three years and nine months, British stamps were not used in Hong Kong. The story of postal operations during Japanese occupation is the subject of uh, other colleagues' specialty, specifically Philippe Orsetti. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, usages pre-occupation. Here's the first day cover. It's philatelic because it's overpaying the local rate, which was five cents. Um, it's the interesting thing about this first day cover, besides the postman's beat shop and the um, by bombers slogan, is the excerpt from the newspaper advertising that from 1st of November, the stamp will be available at post offices. Uh, here's a nice 1941 usage, only six days after the uh, issuance of the stamp on November 6th. Um, it's an interesting way to frank a dollar fifty rate per half ounce airmail to New Zealand. Um, it's uh, fifteen eight cent stamps and a pair of fifteens to make up the one dollar fifty rate, but it is commercial. It's going from a company to a company, so it looks like it's commercial and it's uh, it's a fun cover that I was lucky to find. Um, I've got another one here with the eight cent stamp, uh, paying the eight cent rate, surface rate to China, going to Shanghai from uh, branch Kowloon branch. Um, it's registered, so there's another twenty five cent stamp to pay the registry fee, nicely tied with with that Kowloon cancel. 
uh, on 25th of November. This is now late in the time before the Japanese occupation. And there's that uh, LR marking, uh, Lettre Recommande, we think is what it stands for. Um, and it's a nice, uh, clear copy of it. Um, so World War II ends. When World War II was won by the Allies, Hong Kong was liberated in August 1945. Postal operations were first handled by the military, and the post office started operations on September 28th. Um, returning British postal officials found seven mailbags from before the start of Japanese occupation. These were mails that did not make the last ship or flight out of the colony before things shut down in December 1941. The Hong Kong Post Office, being responsible stewards of the mails, promptly applied the ha a hand stamp detained in Hong Kong by Japanese December 1941 to September 1945 and sent the letters on their way. There are over 200 recorded such detained covers famously exhibited in in great quantity and diversity by my colleague Sam Chu. The cover is, is my example with a quirk of rarity. Uh, Sam advised me this is the only detained cover with perfins. You could see a little bit of the perfins here. And when I examined the uh, four cent stamp, it definitely has uh, the perfin HSBC, Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. It's a 20 cent rate cover to Canada, and that rate was extended um, after the war. After liberation, uh, the pre-war rates were reinstated as much as possible. Stocks of the eight cent stamp became immediately available. Uh, the GPO reopened on September 28th, 1945, and people lined up to get souvenir covers of this event. Uh, Totally philatelic cover here, but it shows the um, use uh, of the available stamps in the post office, including the eight cent. And it's uh, time 10 a.m., which was the hour of opening of that stamp. So the subtitle of this talk, A Stamp Interrupted by War, uh, is, is, is now shown. It personified the Hong Kong city-state, which was so drastically interrupted by World War II. Um, so post-war, there's, there's more to the story. Um, after depredation of three and a half years of Japanese occupation, the city's population had been reduced to approximately 600,000 from the pre-war population of approximately 1.6 million. Uh, the broken and neglected wartime infrastructure was rapidly rebuilt. An influx of returning Hong Kong citizens who had fled to mainland China, as well as traders, bankers, missionaries, military, academics, and most importantly, mainland Chinese who feared the end of their nationalist government as Mao Zedong's communists were on the verge of winning their civil war. By 1947, the Hong Kong population was approximately 1.7 million. With the trader, trader's economy, burgeoning manufacturing, and low-cost labor, the colony reverted to growth mode. So this necessitated worldwide communications, which at the time were predominantly by mail. The eight-cent rate for, for letters to Macau, China, and Taiwan continued until March 31st, 1948. So there were many more printings of the eight cent stamp. Um, here's an example of a cover on the first day of resumption of ferry service to Macau, which uh, occurred in October 1st, 1945. It's um, 20 cent, uh, 20 times weight for a dollar 60 rate for that uh, lane. Uh, I have this one also in my Hong Kong 1945 exhibit. Uh, some post-war usages. Um, these stamps remained valid for postal use for a long time and, um, and were used to make up all kinds of uh, interesting rates. 
Uh, here I'm showing a uh, branch post office use, usage. This is Shenguan uh, on October 11th, which is three days after that branch opened after the occupation. Uh, this is a double weight cover going to Canton, missionary mail for the Salvation Army. Um, here's a, a usage of those eight cent stamps to make up a, a 20 cent rate with accompanying two cents, so 10 and 10. And, uh, this commercial cover going to Canada is personally interesting to me because Mrs. A. R. Clark and Company, which is a leather um, manufacturer, um, is was one of my customers when back in the days when I was working. Um, here's some post-war usage that I consider really a lot of fun. Finding covers with the eight cent stamp. This one is so quirky in the way of how it was frank. Typically, registered mail would be franked by the um, postal clerk at the counter. It, I, I might be wrong on that, but normally that's how it works. And this was a two two dollar and twenty five cent rate, two dollars per half ounce for the air mail, twenty five cents for registration. So that's cool, except for how they made that rate up. <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking to use a bunch of eight cent stamps, but I'm glad they did. And it all works out to that two dollars and twenty-five cents with these, you know, fifty cents, couple of thirties, couple of tens, and five eights. It all works out. Now the lower one is from the same correspondence, Montgomery Ward in Chicago. Now, this one is in 1948, going with the thirty cent rate, except for three times eight is thirty. Sorry, three times eight is twenty-four, and five. It makes it 29 cents. So it's one cent underpaid and it wasn't caught. I thought, wow, that's strange because the Hong Kong Post Office was very good at catching underpaid mail. But then I see it was mailed from the Catholic mission by Sister Mary um, Beatrice. And maybe the postal clerk was going to be kind to the sister. Uh, post war usage, some more of it, 1946. Uh, Sham Shui Po branch uh, letter to China for that eight cent China rate. Um, here, the bottom one is a tax uh, letter where somebody was using the eight cent stamp to send a surface letter to the UK, and that should have had a uh, 20 cent franking. Um, the tax mark is from Hong Kong. Uh, there is a receiver marking, but no evidence of payment of the uh, post. To do this one, I remember was a gift from um, our previous chairman, uh, uh, and uh, it was it was a lovely thing to have. Uh, so another post-war usage. Sometimes they made up the postage with eight cent stamps to get the forty cent rate. So five times eight is forty, and there's a nice letter by airmail to Penang in 1947. And uh, the bottom one is a little bit scarcer destination of Nepal, an air letter, which would have had a 40 cent rate also. And they use a pair of eights and a four to make 20 and the 20 cent UPU for 40 cents. And the last post-war usage example is uh, this letter, this air letter to Trinidad. Again, a nice destination. And although the cover is a little bit worn and a little bit dirty, I love this way of franking the 40 cents with a block of four of the eight and a block of four of the two to make up 40 cents. This is a bit later in 1952, later in the period. So let's talk about revenues. In 1946, some of the King George's six definitives were overprinted for revenue use. This was due to shortages of, of revenue stamps that were being used for things such as contract notes, bills of exchange, and receipts. Um, they, they are found both in commercial transactions as well as documents pertaining to the extensive bureaucracy running the colony's affairs. Um, the eight cent was was made into a receipt stamp with five cent revaluation. Other King George's six definitives were overprinted for 
revenue usage, like this 10 cent became a 10 cent receipt stamp. And this 30 cent became a 10 cent receipt stamp. They obviously needed a lot more 10 cent stamps. Uh, documentary use of these stamps is intriguing with a wide array of forms. And I do show an example of a form. I have a number of them. Oh, yeah. And then this one is the uh, illegal postal use of the stamp after it was overprinted for revenue. And uh, somebody tried to mail something with a 10 cent valuation. And it did get chopped by the Hong Kong post office. So somehow it escaped the authorities' notice and got through. But I wish I had the cover that that was on. So, the, so here I have a marginal block of 24 of this issue. And this is where we come back to that flaw I talked about. That little thickened line in the uh, tablet with the swastika shows up in this block and um, gives us an idea of the position of that uh, flaw. Uh, very happy to have found that on the uh, overprint. It took me a long time to find it, but there it is. And here's revenue usage. Uh, this is a receipt for water charges for the month of $7 and rent of $580 for the public billiard saloon on the seventh floor of the China building. I just love this document. It just gives you such a, a sense of um, social history and the fact that everybody had to pay a little fee, in this case, 15 cents, to get that receipt as proof of payment of their rent and water charges. Perfins. Uh, since the 18th 60s, Hong Kong commercial firms and government departments employed a system of security markings to prevent fil pilfering of stamps. The markings were either hand stamps or perforated initials, uh, also known as perfins, of the company name. By the 1930s, the use of security markings was declining, and in the King George VI era, only nine companies, mostly banks and utilities, were using perfins. Uh, here's a um, pair of the 8 cent with the HSBC perfin dated uh, November 21st. Um, I don't have any other 8 cent stamps except the ones on that detained cover with perfins, but there are, um, I do have a whole collection of Georgia 6 perfin stamps. Uh, postal stationery. So on October 21st, 1946, a set of three three postal stationary envelopes were issued for local China and overseas use in the respective denominations of five cents green, eight cents brown and 20 cents black. Uh, there was also at a different date, a 19, a uh, 15 cent uh, envelope. Um, but um, this issue is really, really hard to find used. Uh, the eight cent one, I have seen one, uh, back in uh, London 2015, there was a dealer who had one, and his price for it was so outrageous, I, I just declined. I, I'm sorry I did, because I've never seen a commercially used version of this envelope. Um, the specimen is probably the easiest one to find. The mint you do see also pretty regularly in auctions. I recently acquired this one. It's a first day cover obvious philatelic use so i don't think it's super rare or anything but i'm still regretting not buying that uh commercially used one uh, from a german dealer in uh, 2015. and uh, usage of these stamps on jusca mail so jusca mail and an, an aspect of aerophilately is the system of placing directions on covers in the initial stages of airmail, letters were often routed by a combination of air and surface modes as airlines developed their itineraries to ever farther destinations. This necessitated the practice of the sender or the origin post office placing routing instructions on the envelope 
to indicate how far it was to travel by air before it was transferred or exchanged to surface for carriage to final destination. The place where these Juska mails terminate air service and are placed in surface transport modes is called the exchange office. Originally, these markings were manuscript, uh, but eventually postal authority provided hand stamps named Juska in the official UPU language of French. Juska translates to as far as, and Juska markings were used in Hong Kong from the 1930s through to the 1950s. And here's a few examples. Uh, the first one here is uh, the 40 cent air letter rate uh, with five times eights uh, going by air to office of exchange only. I was uh, told by Duncan Crew that uh, because Calcutta is an exchange office itself, I was surprised that this didn't go through by air. But at that time, the exchange office would have been Singapore. So air from Hong Kong to Singapore and then surface Singapore to Calcutta. Here's one by air to London only going to the USA. It's an overpaid letter. Uh, the rate should have been a dollar thirty, but they use a an eight cent to uh, get the dollar uh, twenty five up to within the rate that it's supposed to be, and it was overpaid by three cents. Uh, it would have gone by air to London and then by uh, ship to uh, across the Atlantic to the. USA and then by train all the way across to uh, you to San Francisco. Um, the French had a uh, a uh, exchange office at Marseille, and uh, Hong Kong issued a ex uh, jusqu'à marking par avion de Hong Kong à Marseille. Uh, here's a 1947 example again with. The two and, ten, and eight making up a 10 and 20, and the one for a $1.30 rate per half ounce. And this last Juska airmail uh, cover is one of my favorites just because it's plastered with so many of these eight cent stamps. Um, it's uh, got receiving cancels, it's got the by air throughout marking. By air throughout was started to. Uh, be instructed as, as a Juska marking. Um, typically at that period, um, going all the way by air was more expensive. So the rate was a little bit higher uh, than uh, going via only part of the way via air mail. But in this case, the by air throughout rate would have been $2 per half ounce. And if you total up all those stamps on here, it comes to five dollars and seven cents. Uh, you had the twenty-five cents for registration, so theoretically, this should have been four twenty-five or six twenty-five. But in fact, it all adds up to five dollars and seven cents. So there's a mystery there of how they got to that rate. But um, I've been told by a, a dealer when I when I question uh, a a cover which had an, an impossible or, or difficult rate. And he said, you know what? I have a large pile of covers where the rate is indecipherable. And uh, you're going to find that if you collect postal history, that sometimes you just come up against a rate that doesn't make sense. And it's either people being over eager with plastering stamps on their covers uh, or just uh, error. So this is... Uh, a fun, a really fun cover. Military concession rates. So after liberation, a military administration and forces remained in Hong Kong for several years. Until October 3rd, 1949, soldiers stationed in Hong Kong were considered to be on active service. As such, if they marked their letters on active service or forces mail, they would get the concessionary rate. Uh, at, at the very beginning, they were granted airmail postage for free, at which time their mails would be sent by the Royal Air Force. But on May 1st, 1947, um, a concessionary postage rate of 10 cents per half ounce for commercial air service by BOAC was instituted. This was raised to 20 cents per half ounce on April 1st, 1948. 
There was a great discount from the normal air mail, air mail rates, which ranged between a dollar per quarter ounce and a dollar thirty per half ounce. While there are a few eight cent stamps found on covers for this service, um, one intriguing one is this 17 cent rate cover to Denmark. Uh, there was a contingent of Danish soldiers in the colony after the war, and examples of mail at the 10 cent rate to Denmark exist. Um, and the 17 cent rate, when I got this cover, I couldn't figure out how that rate worked, but it seems to be a second step charge for you know one, uh, one extra ounce or an extra half ounce. But um, the reason I believe that is because Duncan Crew, when I showed this cover to him and asked for an explanation of the rate, he said he had one to the UK with the same 17 cent rate. And I actually did acquire an image of that. So there is cover evidence that the second step rate for that military concession um, rate was 17 cents. But we're not sure because it's not documented. I have a little rate table showing the schedule of the rates for that military concession. It's, a, it's an interesting study in itself. And um, getting close to the end now, we're going to talk about the imperforate error. In December 1946, it was reported that a sheet of imperforate eight cent stamps was found at the GPO. The comprador at GPO sent the sheet to Sai Ying Poon branch uh, because he deemed it was unworthy to sell these stamps at the GPO, but at a branch, sure, they can use these damaged stamps. And so eight cents being the rate for letters to China, the bulk of them must have been posted on letters going there. No such cover has ever been found. There were only a few stamps left on the sheet before a stamp collector noticed the imperforates and their significance. The story of who initially acquired the vertical strip of five is incomplete. After all, this was still a relatively early post-war Hong Kong. Um, eventually, the strip was broken into two, a three and a two. So I have the uh, images here. Um, the strip of two was sold at Spink in 2016 for 40,000 pounds. A noted dealer collector, Henry Dalouz, acquired the strip of three and sold it to the financier, Sir Percival David, in 1955 by private treaty. Uh, there's a letter that covers that purchase, which uh, I got a photocopy of. Um, fast forward to Capex 22 in Toronto where the South African dealer Doreen Royan attended. I knew that Doreen had previously listed the strip of three for private treaty with a price on request. I was stunned to learn that she brought the strip to Capex 22 and she let me look at it. So I got a close look at this, one of the greatest King George's VI uh, rarities, not just from Hong Kong, but from all King George's six stamps. Unfortunately, the price on request was 250,000 pounds. So I would have to remortgage my house for it. I checked with my wife just to be certain, but the answer as anticipated was no. But I held it in advance for a few minutes. So, um, yeah. So in conclusion, here's the last cover showing the uh, usage very late 1956, it's a 15 cent uh, printed matter rate going to the US, completely commercial cover, um, nicely uh, uh, tied with a, is your radio licensed slogan and uh, overpaying the printed matter by one cent. But it's interesting that people still had these stamps and used them as late as 1956. I have other Georgia sixth definitives being used even later, up to 1959. Uh, but this is the latest eight cent one that I could find. So as a part of the conclusion, I wanna show you a few more eight cent brown stamps, uh, not just from Hong Kong, like they did have it in the postage due issue of 1946, but also Canada had an eight cent brown uh, that was issued in 1942 as part of their 
medium value definitives. And then uh, after the war in 1946, Canada issued what they call the peace issue and the eight cent was still in brown color. So um, this was a talk about one little stamp, which caused me to do a lot of research, uh, some discovery and learning, and essentially a lot of joy. And I just had so much fun doing this and collecting this over the years. I've been collecting this stamp for about 15 years. I started uh, maybe 20 now. If, yeah, it's getting closer to 20 because it was in that London 19, uh, London 20. 15 exhibition that I started getting serious about it. And I'm suggesting to you, dear listeners, why not try it? Pick a stamp of your choice and just go crazy on it. Mm -hmm. I also have a page of references, lots of different uh, source materials. Um, this one uh, will be uh, with the, um, hopefully with the posting online so you can look up which uh, my sources are. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, uh, fantastic talk. Uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, yes. So so the, the eight cent stamp. You know, it's only one stamp, but uh, I, I'm I'm just. Uh, surprised that you actually can find so many different things that you could collect on it um uh, you know all, all the all the uh the revenue for prints as well as the ucgs um and this there's a there's a, a question i want to ask um I, I, I think on the first maybe one or two slides you actually show the uh, uh, some requisition blocks with number b on uh, you actually show two blocks. One, the the, the B uh, and the number is on the the left side, and one on top. Uh, is is that the same yes. representation, or why is it printed yeah. different way? Uh, those those requisition numbers were hand stamped on, mm. and sometimes the person doing that hand stamping picked the top ah, top okay. corner or the side corner and and it's on both on both sides there's also the ones on the right side you oh, sometimes no. find them on top and sometimes in the side it's a bit random oh really yeah. 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 Okay. and i do have examples okay. of all the different varieties i just you know for the sake of the slide i didn't put them all on mm -hmm. i see i think i think i think it's uh, recognized that the two positions for the requisition uh, uh, block uh, for the requisition number and letter are associated with how the sheets were fed into the machine, bottom fed, um, top fed or side fed. Yeah. There's yes, Nick. Confounding factor, which is that it is known that for some territories, at least. Um, when they were printing, if a sheet was damaged, they would tear out the damaged part of the sheet or tear half the sheet off and dispose of it, but still send out the other half. And mm. they were still numbered. So if it if um, if the damaged part of the sheet was where the number usually was applied, then the numbers had to be applied somewhere else. So mm. that certainly happened as well. I don't know what that did to their accounting because I thought the numbers were applied for accounting purposes. And that means that, you know, you, you had to have more, more sheet numbers than you would have expected. But anyway. Mm. Yeah, you probably had notes in the tables uh, to say that uh, for this requisition number, there was a, a lower number of, of stamps because of damage. Yes, that's, that's I agree with Nick. Um... Certainly, I've seen uh, uh, so large blocks with a number on uh, right in the middle of the top. Uh, so presumably, maybe half the sheet was damaged, and uh, uh, or maybe they supplied them in half sheets. I don't know to make up the numbers. Yeah, I, I've studied the wartime requisitions in some detail, but I don't have everything to hand. But I can show you 
a list uh, of uh, two locations of the uh, the uh, requisition sheet numbers, if you wish. I can share that. Yeah, sure. Please do. Right, can you see that? Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. I was trying to find out the the uh, rate for the forces for Ingo while he was uh, explaining. This is the eight cent. So you can see here that some are uh, the ones at the top. The numbers are all top fed sheets. Actually, uh, Richard, we're 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 looking at a postmaster general report of July nineteen January nineteen forty seven. You have to close that one, and then uh -huh. you have to stop share and then reshare with the right image. Thank you, thank you, thanks, Inga. Let, let's try that again. I'm curious to see those babies. <laughs> um, let me see where, where they gone. I also met the South African lady in London. It's quite interesting. Yeah, I'm sure I could have bargained a little bit, but still, you know, how much can you take off two hundred fifty thousand pounds? Is that the requisition B instead of some other yes. rubbish that yeah. I have on my computer? Um, yeah, I spoke to her at quite some length, and she did not appreciate the various controversies surrounding Mr. Dalutz. Uh, so I hope I didn't alarm her. <laughs> Anyway, well, the the, the item the came with a. Sorry to interrupt, Richard. Yeah, when when she showed me that, the item came with a letter from Dalus, a correspondence yes, between him. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting piece, and we talked about it at a previous uh, meeting here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, the requisition B for uh, the eight cent. They said that requisition sheets that I know of. The ones at the top up here are top fed sheets with the number at the top right. And the ones below are bottom fed sheets where the serial numbers are in the left margin at the top. So, and it's really quite weird. Um, but you can see from the numbering that the earlier ones were top fed. And the later ones were bottom fed. Can you scroll that page up a bit? No, I mean down. I'm sorry, I meant down. How far down? It goes. It's miles. <laughs> what do you want to see? Okay. Well, the uh, bottom, the bottom fed ones. Yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, got it. So, uh, and I sort of got these things together a bit from various sources, including uh, including your good self, uh, Inga. Mm. Wow. I've only been looking at the requisition blocks. Right. Because the interest that I have is the delivery and what happened to the, all these deliveries, because quite a number of the deliveries never made it. Um, how it happened and all that stuff. So that's my interest. But So the, the requisition blocks and the numbering of existing ones and non-existing ones is sort of relevant to that. But anyway, um, let's see from various places. So here's here's one on the side and so on. So um, let me see if I can find the big big ones that. Let's 
So here is one on the side. Full sheets. Nice. Oh, that's that's the only one that I have actually. So, uh, sorry to. It's a bottom to... fed. Yeah. 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 And, um, and also, you mentioned that uh, you 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 uh, weren't aware of the uh, quantities for the requisition D. I think I have that somewhere, and I'll try and dig it out. Um, oh, that would be great. Correspondence after the war, um, because the requisition was done. I think it was done in London before Mr. Harris, who was in charge in Hong Kong later, um, flew out to to to, to Hong Kong. That's it. Okay, that would be great. Then I can complete the census. Wow. Thank you, Richard. And Thank there you. Were, there, there were, there were, there were uh, as you said earlier, there were a number of uh, um, sheets and stuff which the, were found after the war in the vault at the General Post Office. But there were also quite a I think there were a number kept by the Crown agents as well, and they were shipped out after the war. Yeah, I'll try. I'll try and put. I I was going to do this as part of an overall thing with requisition B and requisition C at some point, but I thought you might be interested today. Do you want me to send you scans of my requisition blocks of that stamp? Sure. If the uh, yeah, if the, uh, yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I'll go through them. I have more, but uh, I have. I find E is the is not that frequently seen. I don't, my my interest would would be just in the B ones, right? Um, but if you if you have those, that would be marvelous. Thank right. you in advance. I think the the B. The B one was the, the well, one B before the war, and then the D one was the uh, requisition for 1946. When you, uh, Richard, when you when you talk about uh, uh, top fed and uh, bottom fed, well, it obviously it's the, it depends on where the sheets are fed into the machine. Um, how about sideways? Side, uh, do you have a, a sideways fed? In some cases, but Is not in this. Machine or... Not with this one. No. Not with this one. Okay. And um, also, also, uh, you know, it's quite interesting where where all these uh, emergency um, issues were were printed and perforated. Because it's not, it's never been a hundred percent clear. I've tackled Nick Hellwood on that in recent times, but haven't finished that discussion. Mm. I, I gathered that there there were several machines, perforating machines. You can see so different extension holes as well. So uh, yeah, that's also part of which direction they were fed. Yeah. Right. But, um, uh, yeah. Hello, Richard. Hello. Yes. Hello, Richard. Yeah, Simon. Simon here. Uh, well, um, would you mind uh, going back to your uh, first page of what you have just uh, shown us, uh, the eight cents with a cover and, and several descriptions? Yeah, sure. Let me see if I can do that. As you know, I'm useless with uh, technology. So, uh, no, sorry, not not this one. Uh, perhaps the the this, the next page with, with a cover. The one at the front, yeah. I think it's the one at the top. I think Harmon yeah, said yeah, yeah, it right. to me. Um, 
I'm not sure where you know that did this person learn learn chat team? In, in fact, it's the postal clerk in Kowloon Central or Kowloon Post Office uh, on, on the no. first day of uh, the opening on the 28th of September and who discovered the Kowloon Hong Hong uh, uh, day stamp era. And in fact, yes. uh, he, 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 he himself produced it, uh, according to rumors, the 20 something covers uh, uh, using that uh, Kowloon Hong Hong stamps, uh, day stamp. And, and in fact, a few of, of, of those covers were, were having the eight cents uh, at the fin. And uh, in my record, uh, just, just a, a few of them are, are having that registration number on top of that eight cents stamp. And they were, uh, they, they are all having uh, uh, the number uh, B, uh, let me see, just, just a moment. Uh, let me check my record. Um, the, the, the record system number of, of those uh, few counter Hong Kong couples having that extends definitive uh, are all started with B0800 something. And yeah. Yes, I, think, I think they're the ones up here. Yeah, so so uh, yeah, that, that just for your reference. Yeah, I know. I know that this this guy was uh, involved in the production of the Hong Kong covers, along with Mister Fernandez. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they did them for themselves, uh, along with the five cent centenary and uh, requisition numbers too. Yeah, right. I have them somewhere. Uh, just a few, just, just, just uh, uh, in my record, just a few of, of those, those uh, covers are, are, are having the, the registration number B uh, something. Yeah, yes. Okay, yes. so just for the information. Thank you. Good, great, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts about uh, you know your know, last month I showed um, an imperf eight set um, which which looks like uh, some kind of plate or die proof uh, uh, with, with a with a with a certificate from the uh, old certificate from BPA uh, saying it's it's a forgery. So any, any thoughts? I know uh, I've seen it. Them. I've seen it in the Facebook group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's possible to manufacture that. You know, you take the genuine stamp and then you know transpose it onto some thicker paper. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's doable as a fake. I, I really really doubt that that's from the from the true imperforate yeah. sheet. I okay. was skeptical. Well, I think it looks a bit thicker uh, actually from the stamp. Yeah. The scan was in very high resolution, uh, which I which I downloaded. But uh, very fortunately, I think that the person uh, the, it it was it was bought by a, a local uh, local Hong Kong collector, um, whom uh, I think I think he he also uh, features on on Facebook. I, I'm I'm pretty sure that he'll probably send the stamp to to be certified or or looked at by the experts and see. The true status of it. Um, yeah. I mean, there, there's at the moment uh, there's uh, two two kinds of theory. One is S, uh, the BPA certificate says it, it's is a kind of forgery, or um, it, it is some kind of uh, maybe a, 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 a trial proof or something, because he he actually the collector actually did notice that the um the the the, the, the Chinese character eight uh, is different. From the uh, from the genuine stamp, uh, so um, maybe it was it, it was made from a default, uh, a defective uh, die or something, uh, uh, and uh, and the die was rejected, and um, after making some sort of like uh, uh, die proofs, and they were rejected, and the new die made or corrected something like that. It's, it's all a bit of a fun, really. <laughs> That, that that would explain the uh, thicker paper. 
Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, because as you know, then a lot of the dive proofs, well, obviously they they, uh, they they do exist on a complete card, but sometimes they're all cut down into the stamp size to be painted yeah. on the record sheets. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions from, from the floor? Yeah. Right, good. Um, well, I, I think uh, without further questions, I think um, we have had a very nice evening. Uh, and um, you know, I'm sure that uh, everybody will be w would like to actually do uh, uh, like a single stamp uh, uh, research and um, you know, do actually we, I, I do have uh, the, the 20 cent uh, stamp, um, the King George VI, but the, it is actually far less glamorous than the eight cent. Uh, um, uh, but nevertheless, it's fairly interesting to, to find um, uh, uses uh, of, of the stamp as well. Anyhow, oh, I, I see that uh, uh, Dr. Prakov, uh, you know, the FIP president, uh, is, uh, is with us uh, this evening. So uh, welcome, Dr. Prakov. We haven't seen you for, for some time. So um, uh, uh, Dr. Prakov must be very busy. With the uh, with the Thailand 2023 uh, World Stamp Champion uh, next week, uh, no, no, two week, uh, in in a fortnight's time, and uh, I, I'm we are so honoured to have your presence at uh, at our Zoom meeting. Would you like to say a few words? Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Andrew. Good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit late. Uh, as Dr. Andrew mentioned, uh, Bangkok. Uh, 20, sorry, uh, Thailand 2023 is uh, going to be happened in uh, Bangkok in uh, two weeks from now. And before that, uh, Dr. Andrew himself and uh, Soto Sang from uh, Japan had kindly uh, accept to uh, conduct a jury uh, training similar to the FIP training in Bangkok before the uh, exhibition starts. So I hope that uh, all of you, if possible, uh, would kindly uh, join the uh, exhibition in Bangkok, which I believe that uh, all of you will enjoy it. And thank you, uh, Dr. Andrew, and all those, uh, all of you who kindly attend and uh, share the uh, show and tell some uh, nice times and uh, covers. And look forward to uh, seeing you all in uh, person again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prakov. Yeah. So uh, yes, um, the the exhibition list has been posted uh, on the website. Uh, I think I noticed it today. So uh, I mean, it looks that there are some very uh, good, uh, interesting, as well as powerful exhibits around. And certainly, I mean, if you could find uh, a few days of, of a break or something, it's well worth uh, going. Um, to to Bangkok and check it out, and also uh, you know uh, just to enjoy the the, uh, the the beautiful scenery, the sights of Bangkok, and also the food and uh, lots of shopping. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, I, I'm sure that the the, the Ingo actually has an exhibit um, uh, in, in, with Bangkok. Uh, so uh, I, we we hope that uh, he'll do very well this time. <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, you know, for joining the meeting, um, and uh, uh, we'll be seeing each other um, in a month's time in, in December, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about something interesting. Uh, I, 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 I'd like to um, thank uh, the, the FIEP for sponsoring our uh, Zoom meeting, as always, and we look forward to see you all next month. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good evening, good morning, and good afternoon. Uh, it's goodbye from here. Bye-bye. See you next month. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.